We've been talking over the last couple of days about uh, a lot of topics. Um, we've just been talking about agencies, their role, the role of creative within uh, media organizations. Um, we've looked particularly at storytelling and the role of the editor, um, uh, what, what might, might once have seemed a role that uh, um, was being undermined by uh, the rise of uh, native advertising, uh, content creation for commercial purposes, but it turns out is alive and well and the driving spirit behind some of the most uh, profitable brands in the digital media space, um, just as it used to be in the old analog world. So our next speaker has a story to tell us about how quality content turns directly into success, uh, measured, if you like, uh, by revenue, by readers, primarily uh, how content turns into dollars. So please welcome the editorial director of the New Yorker magazine, Henry Fender. Henry. Here we are. Um, I am Henry Fender. Um, this has been a fascinating morning. We've heard about uh, media buyers as robotic vacuum cleaners. We've heard about uh, the rise of um, snackable content. My perspective is a little bit different. Um, because I am the editorial director of a 91-year-old publication, a kind of classic incumbent print-associated uh, media entity, which has the blessing and the burden of this Regency-era dandy as its, uh, as its icon, peering through a, a monocle at a, at, a, at a butterfly. That doesn't seem very, um, doesn't seem very cutting edge. And so the big challenge for us is uh, how do we adapt to a changing landscape of digital dissemination and, um, and consumption. How do we preserve the new part of the New Yorker? Um, that's been uh, something that we've devoted a lot of uh, thought about and had a lot of counsel uh, about uh, in the past uh, 15, 20 years. So I'm gonna pull the camera back a little bit further and not just talk about the last you know, year or the last two years, but um, uh, trends that we've seen earlier because this transformation really posed some existential questions um, to us as a magazine uh, and really to the magazine um, as a genre. Uh, one question is uh, essentially, are you, what are you? What is a magazine? Are you a, um, a format or are you a form? That's an important question because if you are a format, then you can die. You can go extinct. Um, you can become you know, the eight-track tape of your era. If you're a, a form, then you don't die. You know, uh, formats for music disappear. Music itself does not disappear. And that's because on some level, the element that you do not disrupt is the human factor. You know, the human being doesn't get disrupted. The human being still uh, watches and reads and listens, still consumes media uh, in the same kind of primal way. So when you, um, when you start meditating upon the, the sort of miscellany of different parts that make up a magazine, people come to you and they do ask that basic question. Um, why do these things belong together? Um, is it the case that you are um, actually uh, a play about forced consumption? Uh, people ask us to contemplate the, uh, uh, what I think of as the parsley paradigm. Uh, at least in the United States, if you um, walk into a supermarket, you buy parsley. Parsley comes in these big, you know, six or eight ounce clumps. Nobody ever wanted that much parsley. The entire parsley industry is predicated upon coerced consumption. It would crater without that. And so people wanted to ask us, well, is that what you're about? Maybe we should disaggregate you. Um, uh, maybe... Uh, you should have a big buffet, and moreover, they were asking this 15 years ago, maybe that buffet should be free. You would have a big, um, a big billboard for advertising, and you would give everything away from free, and of course you would monetize the, uh, uh, the traffic that you had. Now, historically, as we learned from the newspaper industry, that logic um, didn't really uh, work out so well. Um, we are always, of course, mindful of the large sectoral and secular uh, trends when it comes to online advertisement, but the, um, the, the uh, 
um, skepticism for us was whether the, um, the idea of simply giving stuff away for free was modeled. So then people came back and they said, oh, we have a solution for you. Micropayments. Once again, we want you to disaggregate and just have a kind of pay as you go, eat what you want, uh, you know, we'll weigh you up at the cashier at the end. It was kind of this, uh, uh, the idea that you would have lots of little micropayments and, uh, and that was the future for the magazine. Many people, you know, a dozen years ago were proposing this. We didn't really like that future. We, uh, we had some, some real questions about that. Um, and so we, uh, we built a website. Um, you know, some years ago, BuzzFeed uh, had an article headlined, The New Yorker is the best magazine around, so how come it has the worst website around? Uh, nobody is saying that anymore. In about maybe 2012, we started really um, making an investment in developing uh, this website. We, uh, we built a website and we built a wall. Um, and um, I want to talk about both things. The, um, the website as we conceived it was going to be the daily equivalent of the weekly magazine. And it would cover the same range of material, it would cover news subjects, it would cover cultural commentary and reflection, it would, cover, it would have humor, it would have cartoons. Uh, it would be a kind of you know, uh, hour by hour um, um, counterpart to the weekly magazine. And we, the ambition was that it would relate to other websites in the way that the magazine related to other magazines, that it would be distinctive uh, in terms of checking, distinctive in terms of editing, distinctive in terms of the voices that it, uh, it contained. And so a key part of our uh, strategy over time was to um, develop by pruning, by actually uh, uh, cropping content in strategic ways. So when we started, we might have had you know, 500 contributors uh, with an average yearly contribution of one post. Um, but, you know, we thought, well, the magazine is really written by 45 people. Um, what we wanted to do was to narrow the talent pool in a way, to kind of grow through filtration. Uh, so you would might go from 500 to 50 contributors with maybe an average contribution of, of 10. Uh, and, of course, many people writing uh, every day, uh, some people even, you know, posting more often. So what we were doing was we were deepening familiarity and we were deepening regularity. And that, uh, that kind of focus, uh, the focus on quality rather than on quantity, um, seemed to pay off. But it's one thing to build something of value, because then the next part is you have to figure out how to get readers to value it. Um, do you lock most of this stuff away? That was a kind of a, uh, a system for a few years. And there's some stuff in front of the paywall, um, and there's a lot of stuff behind the paywall. And then what we did in the uh, summer of, uh, of 2014 was to um, make a radical departure from that, and that was what we think of as the summer of free. For just that summer, for about three months, you could get access to the New Yorker archive, you could get access to the entire issue um, of the magazine um, without payment. Um, and the challenge there, the, the task there was to, to teach readers uh, what could be available, and we, um, you know, we carefully tracked the, uh, um, the kind of um, traffic streams that we're getting, where they came from, and, and uh, how they engaged in the material. And then what we introduced was a kind of a metered um, turnstile. Um, of course, the immediate question is, do you set that to 60 visits a month? Do you set it to one? Uh, we looked at the data analytics. Uh, we peered into our own souls, and we, and we set the number at six. And six turned out to be a kind of a lucky number for us. Um, so, in the old system, you know, the idea was all the good stuff is behind the counter. Um, in the new system, you were um, allowed six free jumps uh, before we ask you to activate the, uh, the entitlement engine. And once that started going up and running, and once the numbers were building, we could then kind of revisit that question, what is a magazine? And um, an image that we liked is it's, it's not just a bunch of random things that could be disaggregated. It really is that of a kind of a carefully cultivated uh, garden. And that's one that you want to revisit uh, in all of its diversity. And we found that, um, that people wanted to visit this garden. And they would actually subscribe before we even asked them to. Uh, and that's because on some level, they wanted to be key holders. They wanted to belong to the, um, uh, to the realm. And so, you know, we've now um, 
been hearing a lot about how push media triumphs over pull media, about how the social web de defeats the, the website, and we've certainly been hearing a lot about the death of the home page, and, and for good reason. Um, what I would say is beware the straight ruler fallacy. Beware anyone who wants to kind of extrapolate from a trend in a, into a straight line, because the reality is most trends are not linear. They are complexly curvilinear, or to put another way, this is the sort of the multiple equilibrium theory of life. Things that decline generally decline to another stable equilibrium point. And if I can, uh, if I can leave you with any thought, it's that when you ever hear me or anybody else talk about the death of something, I want you to resist a little bit and think about how culture often can be additive rather than substitutive. Um, so we are profoundly uh, mindful of the different ecologies that we, we participate in. Uh, Search, for example, you know, the, the, um, um, it's something that we are, you know, we think we do well, we're continually trying to do better, it's a moving target, there's no such thing as, as settled expertise in this area. But here's the thing, because our primary bond is with the reader, we don't consider SEO until after a piece has been written and edited. After that, we make sure that the URL is right, we make sure that the meta tags are right, we want the piece to find its audience, but we'll never put you know, Kanye West and Taylor Swift into the first sentence uh, because of uh, some kind of search optimizing uh, consequences. It's just, we want the piece to find its audience, but we care about the nature of the audience. Um, um, uh, if you come to the New Yorker website in search of the um, Kardashian baby, are you really likely to subscribe? You know, if you come to us in search of the adorable mammal with the teddy bear face, are you really likely to subscribe? And that matters a lot to us. The, it's not just the quality of the website, it's also in a sense the quality of the, uh, of the readership, the quality of the traffic that we're after. And so the same thing, of course, goes with, um, with SMO, with social media optimization. This is, again, you know, it's an area where we can do um, um, A-B testing with promotional language. We can do A-B testing when it comes to uh, the timing of things, but we will never do it with content as such. We don't A-B test, you know, two cheers for Donald Trump versus, you know, let's hear it for Bernie Sanders. That's not, you know, obviously the realm of, of experimentation for us. Um, we know very much the wisdom in recent years has been you go where the people are, you don't ask them uh, to come to you. And of course we know how much of our traffic arrives via Facebook and Twitter and, and so much of other the, of the uh, social media um, platforms. And we're very, very attentive to the need to push out on Tumblr, on, on Instagram, on Pinterest and Google Plus and so on. And of course, that brings us to the issue of, of content syndication. Um, essentially, our policy is we syndicate to any platform that can accommodate the entitlement engine, um, uh, which is, you know, it's Flipboard, it's now Google AMP, very, very fast loading. Um, different media entities make different decisions when it comes to platforms that are not able to accommodate that. Um, one calculation is uh, sell ads against the, against the traffic, uh, make money now. Um, that might be a good call for some entities. Our, our general philosophy is that we'd rather see, we, we would rather forsake dimes now for dollars later. So uh, we are very focused still on, um, on the value of the, of the subscriber, the lifetime value of the subscriber, um, this notion of, of, of membership. Um, in one sense, uh, the question is, you know, that every media entity has to ask is, you know, do you want to be at the mercy of the Roomba or of the reader um, in the terms that were established earlier, uh, earlier this morning? Um, so you have to be mindful of these secular sectoral trends, however well you might be doing as a title. You know, we're doing, of course, very, very well uh, as it happens with, uh, with online advertising. It's very important to us. Uh, but even as we check all boxes, we always want to emphasize the value of community. And so that is ultimately about being heard. It's about being heard by the right people. Uh, we want to date people who are into us, right? Who, who, who value what we have to offer. Um, and that means um, we want uh, potential readers and listeners to be able to find us um, if this is you know, the community that they ultimately wanted to